Thursday celebrates Thursday, the 16th of June, 1904, the day depicted in James Joyce's Ulysses and named after the book's central character, Leopold Bloom. The novel follows the life and thoughts of Bloom and a host of characters, many based on real people, from 8 a.m. through to the wee early hours of the following morning. Ulysses lets us experience all of Dublin life within one day, and one of the biggest characters is Dublin itself. Today, we're going to be visiting some of the famous locations to introduce readings which will bring to life Joyce's immortal words. The first Bloomsday, as we know it, was celebrated in Ireland in 1954, when my great uncle, the poet Patrick Kavanagh, and the writer Flann O'Brien visited the Martello Tower at Sandy Cove, Davy Burns Pub in town, and Seven Eccles Street, reading parts of Ulysses and drinking a great deal as they went. Today, Bloomsday is celebrated across the globe, with readings, performances, reenactments, gorgonzola sandwiches, and many, many, many glasses of burgundy. Ulysses begins where a portrait of an artist left off, with the young artist Stephen Dedalus having returned to Ireland to say his final farewells to his dying mother. Joyce briefly lived here in the Martello Tower, now the James Joyce Tower and Museum. Ulysses begins that morning with Stephen Dedalus, the stately plump Buck Mulligan and Haynes, their English guest, living their best bohemian lives here in the Martello Tower, Sandy Cove, overlooking Dublin Bay and its snot green, scrotum tightening sea. From the roof, Buck Mulligan performs a mock mass with his shaving bowl, mocks Stephen for not praying at his mother's deathbed, jokes that he killed her. They share breakfast before Mulligan goes skinny dipping in the Irish Sea. And not a dry robe in sight. <laughs> Buck Mulligan wiped the razor blade neatly. Then, gazing over the handkerchief, he said, The bard's nose rag. A new art colour for our Irish poets, snot green. You can almost taste it, can't you? He mounted to the parapet again and gazed out over Dublin Bay, his fair oak pale hair stirring slightly. God, he said quietly, isn't to see what algae calls it, a great sweet mother, the snot green sea, the scrotum tightening sea, epi onama hontan adidalis, the Greeks, I must teach you, you must read them in the original, thalata, thalata, she is our great sweet mother, come and look. Stephen stood up and went over to the parapet. Leaning on it, he looked down on the water and on the mail boat clearing the harbour mouth of Kingstown. Our mighty mother, Buck Mulligan said. He turned abruptly, his grey searching eyes from the sea to Stephen's face. The aunt thinks you killed your mother, he said. That's why she won't let me have anything to do with you. Someone killed her, Stephen said gloomily. You could have knelt down, damn it, Kinch, when your dying mother asked you, Buck Mulligan said. I'm hyperborean as much as you, but to think of your mother begging you with her last breath to kneel down and pray for her, and you refused. There is something sinister in you. He broke off and lathered again lightly his farther cheek. A tolerant smile curled his lips. But a lovely mummer. He murmured to himself, Kinch, the loveliest mummer of them all. He shaved evenly and would care, in silence, seriously. Stephen, 
An elbow rested on the jagged granite, leaned his palm against his brow, and gazed at the fraying edge of his shiny black coat sleeve. Pain that was not yet the pain of love fretted his heart. Silently, in a dream, she had come to him after her death. Her wasted body, within its loose brown grave clothes, giving off an odour of wax and rosewood, her breath that had bent upon him, mute, reproachful, a faint odour of wetted ashes. Across the threadbare cuff edge, he saw the sea hailed as a great sweet mother by the well-fed voice beside him. The ring of bay and skyline held a dull green mass of liquid. A bowl of white china had stood beside her deathbed holding the green, sluggish bile which she had torn up from her rotting liver by fits of loud, groaning, vomiting. Buck Mulligan wiped again his razor blade. Ah, poor dog's body, he said in a kind voice. I must give you a short and a few nose rags. How are the second-hand breeks? They fit well enough, Stephen answered. Buck Mulligan attacked the hollow beneath his underlip. The mockery of it, he said contentedly. Second leg they should be. God knows what poxy bowsy left them off. I have a lovely pair with a hair stripe, grey. You look spiffing in them. I'm not joking, Kinch. You look damn well when you're dressed. Thanks, Stephen said. I can't wear them if they are grey. He can't wear them, Buck Mulligan told his face in the mirror. Etiquette is etiquette. He kills his mother, but he can't wear grey trousers. He folded his razor neatly, and with stroking palps of fingers felt the smooth skin. Stephen turned his gaze from the sea and to the plump face with its smoke-blue mobile eyes. Ulysses, with its 700 pages and no chapter headings, copied episodes from Homer's Odyssey to create the structure, and this is where we get our titles. Nestor brings us to a school in Dalkey, where the poetic bohemian Stephen Daedalus teaches Greek history to students who, in all fairness, would rather eat fig rolls. And he is at odds with Mr. Deasy, the stuffy administrator who rants about the state of the nation while Stephen waits to be paid and promises to drop off a letter to his friends in the newspaper. Like Stephen, Joyce briefly taught at Clifton School in Dalkey. Joyce's tower roommate, Oliver St. John Gogarty, wrote that Joyce took the job at Clifton School to finance their bohemian experiment in the Martello Towers. A good investment, if you ask me. Ugly and futile, lean neck and tangled hair and a stain of ink, a snail's bed. Yet someone had loved him, borne him in her arms and in her heart. But for her, the race of the world would have trampled him underfoot a squashed, boneless snail. She had loved his weak, watery blood drained from her own. Was that then real? The only true thing in life? His mother's prostrate body, the fiery Columbanus in holy zeal bestrode. She was no more. The trembling skeleton of a twig burnt into fire, an odour of rosewood and wetted ashes. She had saved him from being trampled underfoot, and had gone, scarcely having been, a poor soul gone to heaven, and on a heath beneath winking stars a fox, red reek of rapine in his fur, with merciless bright eyes scraped in the earth, listened, scraped up the earth, listened, scraped and scraped. Sitting at his side, Stephen solved out the problem. He proved by algebra that Shakespeare's ghost is Hamlet's grandfather, Sergeant peered askance through his slanted glasses, 
Hockey sticks rattled in the lumber room, the hollow knock of a ball and calls from the field. Across the page, the symbols moved in grave Maurice, in the mummery of their letters, wearing quaint caps of squares and cubes. Give hands, traverse, bow to partner. So, imps of fancy of the Moors, gone too from the world, Averroes and Moses, my monodays. Dark men in mien and movement, flashing in their mocking mirrors, the obscure soul of the world, a darkness shining in brightness, which brightness could not comprehend. Do you understand now? Can you work the second for yourself? Yes, sir. In long shady strokes, Sergeant copied the data, waiting always for a word of help, his hand moved faithfully the unsteady symbols, a faint hue of shame flickering behind his dull skin. Amor mattress, subjective and objective genitive. With her weak blood and whey sour milk, she had fed him and hid from sight of others his swaddling bands. Like him was I, these sloping shoulders, this gracelessness. My childhood bends beside me, too far from me to lay a hand there once or lightly. Mine is far and his secret as our, as our eyes, secrets silent, stony sit in the dark palaces of both our hearts, secrets weary of their tyranny, tyrants willing to be dethroned. The sum was done. It is very simple, Stephen said as he stood up. Yes, sir, thanks, Sergeant answered. He dried the page with a, a sheet of thin blotting paper and carried his copy book back to his desk. You had better get your stick and go out to the other, Stephen said, as he followed towards the door the boy's graceless form. Yes, sir. In the corridor, his name was heard, called from the playfield. Sergeant. Run on, Stephen said. Mr. DC is calling you. After he leaves Dawkey, the young artist Stephen Dedalus is walking along Sandy Mount Strand and into eternity. His boots cracking over the seashells as he preoccupies himself with his great loves, philosophy and literature. His stream of consciousness contemplates the ineluctable modality of the visible, the question of what is real and what is not merely appearance. He examines the relationship between sight, object and colour, then closes his eyes as he ponders sound, time and space. Signatures of all things, I'm here to read. Sea spawn and sea wreck, the near and tide, that rusty boo, snot grain, blue silver, rust, coloured signs. Stephen closed his eyes to hear his boots crush, crackling, racking shells. You are walking through a house I'm ever. I am, destroyed at a time, a very short space of time, through very short times of space. Am I walking into eternity along Sandy Mount Strand? Crush, crack, crick, crick, rhythm begins. You see, or you hear. Open your eyes now, or you will. One moment, or you will see if I can see. See now, there all the time without you, and ever shall be, world without end. The grainy sand had gone from under his feet. His boots trod again, a damn crackling mast, razor shells, squeaking pebbles, that on the unnumbered pebble beats, wood saved by ship one, lost armada, unwholesome sand flats, waited to suck his treading soles, breathing upward sewage breath, a pocket of seaweed smouldered in sea fire under a midden of man's ashes. He coasted them, walking wearily. A porter bottle stood up, stogged to its waist in the cakey sand oil. A sentinel, oil of dreadful thirst, broken hoops on the shore, at the land a maze of dark cunning nets. Farther away, chalk scrawled back doors and on the higher beach, a drawing line with two crucified shorts. 
Ring's End, Wigwams of Brown Steersmen and Master Mariners, Human Shells. It is finally time to meet our Bloom's Day namesake, Leopold Bloom, and his hot-blooded Spanish soprano wife, Molly, in number seven, Eccle Street. Bloom makes Molly breakfast in bed, where she spends her afternoons reading racy novels and occasionally entertaining Blaze's Boylan. Bloom is revealed through his inner monologue as he goes about his errands, jumping from one subject to the next, oogling local girls, puzzling how to cross Dublin without passing a pub, thinking of his 15-year-old daughter Millie in Mullingar and his wives, rendezvous. Back at home, he eats a hearty breakfast with relish before ending the chapter in the outhouse with the paper. Mr. Leopold Bloom ate with relish the inner organs of beasts and fowls. He liked thick giblet soup, nutty gizzards, a stuffed roast heart, liver slices fried with crust crumbs, fried hen cods rose. Most of all, he liked grilled mutton kidneys, which gave to his palate a fine tang of faintly scented urine. Kidneys were in his mind as he moved about the kitchen softly, writing her breakfast things on the humpy tray. Gelid, light and air were in the kitchen, but out of doors, gentle summer morning everywhere. Made him feel a bit peckish. The coals were reddening. Another slice of bread and butter. Three, four, right. She didn't like her plate full, right. He turned from the tray lifted the kettle off the hob and set it sideways on the fire. It sat there dull and squat, its spout stuck out. Cup of tea soon, good, mouth dry. The cat walked stiffly round a leg of the table with tail on high. No! Oh, there you are, Mr. Bloom said, turning from the fire. The cat mewed in answer and stalked again stiffly round a leg of the table, mewing. Just how she stalks over my writing table. Prrr. Scrunch my head. Prrr. Mr. Bloom watched curiously, kindly, the lithe black form. Clean to see the gloss of her sleek hide, the white button under the butt of her tail, the green flashing eyes. He bent down to her, his hands on his knees. Milk for the bushins, he said. <coughs> The cat cried. They call them stupid. They understand what we say better than we understand them. She understands all she wants to. Vindictive too. Cruel. Her nature. Curious mice never squeal. Seem to like it. Wonder what I look like to her. Height of a tower? No, she can jump me. Afraid of the chickens she is, he said mockingly. Afraid of the Chook chooks. I never saw such a stupid bussins as the bussins. The cat said loudly. She blinked up out of her avid, shame closing eyes, mewing plaintively and long, showing him her milk white teeth. He watched the dark eye slits narrowing with greed till her eyes were green stones. Then he went to the dresser took the Joe Canlan's milkman had just filled for him, poured warm, bubbled milk on a saucer and set it slowly on the floor. Crrrr, she cried, running to lap. He watched the bristles shining wirily in the weak light as she tipped three times and licked lightly. I wonder is it true if you clip them they can't mouse after? Why? They shine in the dark, perhaps, the tips or... Kind of feelers in the dark, perhaps. He listened to her licking lap. Ham and eggs, no. No good eggs with this drought, they want pure fresh water. Thursday, not a good day either for a mutton kidney at Buckley's. Fried with butter, a shake of pepper. Better a pork kidney at Lugatz's while the kettle is boiling. 
she lapped slower than licking the saucer clean. Why are their tongues so rough? To lap better, all porous holes? Nothing she can eat, he glanced around him. No. On quietly creaky boots, he went up the staircase to the hall, paused by the bedroom door. She might like something tasty. Thin bread and butter she likes in the morning, still, perhaps, once in a way. He said softly in the bare hall, I'm going round the corner, be back in a minute. And when he'd heard his voice say it, he added, You don't want anything for breakfast? A sleepy, soft grunt answered, mm. No, she didn't want anything. He heard then a warm, heavy sigh, softer, as she turned over and the loose brass coits of the bedstead jingled. Must get those settled, really. Pity. All the way from Gibraltar. Forgotten any little Spanish she knew. Wonder what her father gave for it. Old style. Ah, yes, of course. Bought it at the governor's auction, got a short knock. Hard as nails at a bargain, old Tweedy. Yes, sir. A clevener that was. I rose from the ranks, sir, and I'm proud of it. Still, he had brains enough to make that corner in stamps. Now that was far seeing. His hand took his hat from the peg over his initialed heavy overcoat and his lost property off a second hand waterproof. Stamps. Sticky back pictures. Dare say lots of officers are in the swim too. Of course they do. The sweated legend in the crown of his hat told him mutely, Pasto's high grade. <laughs> he peeped quickly inside the leather headband. White slip of paper, quite safe. On the doorstep, he felt in his hip pocket for the latch key. Not there. In the trousers I left off, must get it. Potato I have. Creaky wardrobe, no use disturbing her. She turned over sleepily that time. He pulled the hall door to after him very quietly, more till the footleaf dropped gently over the threshold, a limp lid. Looked shut. All right till I come back anyhow. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the narcotic fueled episode. Lotus Eaters begins Bloom's day long journey through Dublin City and Joyce begins to meditate on drugs, religion and other tactics for avoiding reality. In Greek mythology, the Lotus Eaters were a race of people living on an island dominated by the lotus tree. After they ate the lotus, they would forget their home and loved ones and only long to stay with their fellow lotus eaters. Sounds heavenly. And what better place to find my fix than in the alchemy of Sweeney's chemist. He walked southward along Western Row. But the recipe is in the other trousers. Oh, and I forgot that latch key too. Bored this funeral affair. Oh well, poor fellow, it's not his fault. Uh, when was it I got it made up last? Wait, I changed the sovereign, I remember. First of the month. It must have been, or the second? Oh, he can look it up in the prescriptions book. The chemist turned back page after page. Sandy, shriveled smell he seems to have. Shrunken skull. And old. Quest for the Philosopher's Stone, the Alchemists. Drug aid you after mental excitement. Lethargy then. Why? Reaction. A lifetime in a night. Gradually changes your character. Living all the day amongst herbs, ointments, disinfectants, all his alabaster lily pots, mortar and pestle. Aquidist. Fall or smell almost cure you like the dentist doorbell. Dr. Whack, he ought to physic himself up a bit. 
electry or emulsion? The first fellow that picked a herb to cure himself had a bit of pluck. Simples. Want to be careful. Enough stuff here to chloroform you. Test. Turns litmus paper red. Chloroform. Overdose of laudanum. Sleeping draughts. Love filters. Paragoric poppy sip. Syrup. Bad for the cough. Clogs the pores or the phlegm. Poison's the only cure. Remedy where you least expect it. Clever of nature. About a fortnight ago, sir. Yes, Mr. Bloom said. He waited by the counter, inhaling slowly the keen reek of drugs, the dusty dry smell of sponges and loofahs. A lot of time taken up telling your aches and pains. Sweet almond oil and tincture of benzoin, Mr. Bloom said. And then orange water flower. It certainly did make her skin so delicate, white like wax. And white wax too, he said. Brings out the darkness in her eyes. Looking at me, the sheet up to her eyes, Spanish smelling herself when I was fixing the links of my cuffs. Those homely recipes are often the best. Strawberries for the teeth, nettles and rainwater, Oatmeal, they say, steeped in buttermilk, skin food. One of the old queen's sons, Duke of Albany, was it? Had only one skin. A leap old, yes, uh, three we have. Warts, bunions and pimples to make it worse. But you want a perfume too. What perfume does your uh, peau d'Espagne? That orange water flower is so fresh. My smell these soaps have. Time to get a bath around the corner. Hammam. Turkish. Massage. Dirt gets rolled up in your navel. Nice of a nice girl did it. Also, I think I, yes I, do it in the bath. Curious longing eye. Water to water, combine business with pleasure. Pity no time for massage. Feel fresh then all the day. Funeral be rather glum. Yes, sir, the chemist said. Uh, that was two and nine. Have you brought a bottle? No, Mr. Broom said. Make it up, please. I'll call in later in the day and I'll take one of these soaps. How much are they? Fourpence, sir. Mr. Bloom raised a cake to his nostrils. <sighs> Sweet lemony wax. I'll take this one, he said. That makes three and a penny. Paddy Dignam's funeral cortege takes us from Sandy Mount across the city to Glass Nevin Cemetery. Bloom thinks about death in its most practical terms. The heart is a pump and once you are dead, you are dead. His mind hops from the amorous activities sometimes surrounding funerals to the creative idea of burying people upright rather than lying down in order to save space. He thinks of all the people buried here, having once walked the streets of his Dublin, to the morbid idea of flesh decomposing beneath the ground and the quality it gives to the cemetery soil, and perhaps the botanical gardens next door. Mr. Bloom walked unheeded along his grove by saddened angels, crosses, broken pillars, family vaults, stone hopes, praying with upcast eyes, old Ireland's hearts and hands, more sensible to spend the money on some charity for the living, pray for the repose of the soul of, does anybody really, plant him and have done with him, like down a coal chute, then lump him together to save time, all souls day, 27th, I'll be at his grave, Ten shillings for the gardener, he keeps it free of weeds. Old man himself, bent down double with his shears clipping, near death's door, who passed away, who departed his life, as if they did it of their own accord. Got the shove, all of them. Who kicked the bucket? More interesting if they told you what they were, so and so, wheelwright. A travel for Cork, lie no? I paid five shillings in the pound, or a woman's with her saucepan, a cooked good Irish stew. Eulogy in a country churchyard, it ought to be that poem. 
of whose is it? Wordsworth or Thomas Campbell entered into rest, the Protestants put it. Old Dr. Morrens, the great physician, called them home. But it's God's acre for them. Nice country residence, newly plastered and painted. Ideal spot to have a quiet smoke and read the church times, marriage ads they never tried to beautify. Rusty reeds hung on knobs, garlands of bronze file. Better value, that for the money. Still, the flowers are more poetical. The other gets rather tiresome, never withering. Expresses nothing. Immortelles. A bird sat tamely perched on a poplar branch, like stuffed. Like the wedding present, Alderman Hooper gave ulls. Ho? Not a budge out of him. Knows there are no catapults to let fly at him. Dead animals even sadder. Silly Millie burying the little dead bird in the kitchen matchbox. A daisy chain and bits of broken chain is on the grave. The sacred heart, that is. Showing it, heart on his sleeve. Ought to be sideways and red it should be painted like a real heart. Ireland was dedicated to it or whatever that. Seems anything but pleased. Why this infliction? Would birds come then and peck like the bye with the basket of fruit? But he said no, because they ought to have been afraid of the bye. Apollo that was. How many? All these here once walked round Dublin faithful departed, as you are now so once were we. Besides, how could you remember everybody? Eyes, walk, voice. Well the voice, yes, gramophone. Have a gramophone in every grave, or keep it in the house. After dinner on a Sunday, put on poor old great-grandfather. Crack. Hello, hello, hello. I'm awfully glad. Crack. Awfully glad to see you again. Hello, hello, hello. I'm off. Crypt. Remind you of the vice like the photograph reminds you of the face. Otherwise you couldn't remember the face after 15 years, say. For instance, who? For instance, some fellow that died when I was in Wisdom Helly's. Aeolus brings us to the heart of the Hibernian metropolis with its clever, very clever newspaper headlines. It represents the first of many chapters where Joyce pushes the boundaries of the novel as a form. It takes place in the Freeman and Telegraph newspaper offices on Princess Street. Bloom is taking out an advertisement and Stephen Dedalus is dropping off the letter from Deasy. They bounce newspaper headlines at each other. How great a daily organ is turned out. Short, but to the point. Spot the winner. Dear Dirty Dublin. Before heading to the Oval Bar for a liquid lunch and to blow some more wind. Dear Dirty Dublin Dubliners. Two Dublin Vestals, Stephen said, elderly and pious, have lived 50 and 53 years in Fumbley's Lane. Where's that? The professor asked. Off Black Pits, Stephen said. They want to see the views of Dublin from the top of Nelson's Pillar. They save up three and tenpence in a red tin letterbox money box. They shake out the threepenny bits and sixpences and coax out the pennies with the blade of a knife. Two and three in silver and one and seven in coppers. They put on their bonnets and best clothes and take their umbrellas for fear it may come on to rain. Wise virgins, Professor McHugh said. They buy one and fourpence worth of brawn and four slices of pan loaf at the North City dining rooms in Marlborough Street from Miss Kate Collins, proprietress. They purchase four and twenty ripe plums from a girl at the foot of Nelson's Pillar to take off the thirst of the brawn. They give two threepenny bits to the gentleman at the turnstile and begin to waddle slowly up the winding staircase grunting, encouraging each other, afraid of the dark, panting, one asking the other, have you the brawn? Praising God and the Blessed Virgin, threatening to come down, peeping at the air slits. Glory be to God, they've no idea it was that high. Their names are Anne Cairns and Florence McCabe. Anne Cairns has the lumbago for which she rubs on Lourdes water, given her by a lady who got a bottleful from a passionist father. 
Florence McCabe takes a crew bean and a bottle of double X for supper every Saturday. When they've eaten the brawn and the bread and wiped their 20 fingers in the paper the bread was wrapped in, they go near the railings. Two old Dublin women on the top of Nelson's pillar. But they are afraid the pillar will fall, Stephen went on. They see the roofs and argue about where the different churches are. Rathmine's Blue Dome, Adam and Eve's, St. Lawrence O'Toole. But it makes them giddy to look, so they pull up their skirts, those slightly rambunctious females. Hazy all, Miles Crawford said, no poetic license, we're in the archdiocese here. And they settle down on their striped petticoats, peering up at the statue of the one-handed adulterer. One-handed adulterer, the professor cried. I like that. I see the idea. I see what you mean. It gives them a crick in their necks, Stephen said, and they are too tired to look up or down or to speak. They put the bag of plums between them and eat the plums out of it one after another, wiping off with their handkerchiefs the plum juice that dribbles out of their mouths and spitting the plum stones slowly out between the railings. Can I have a glass of Burgundy and Gorgonzola? Absolutely. Oh, delicious. Bloom brings us through the centre of Dublin where he sees blazes boiling. He nips into the National Museum to avoid him and admires a statue of a Greek goddess, which makes him wonder, are statues anatomically correct? Do statues have holes? He continues on his wander and he feeds some seagulls broken fragments of Banbury cake, which he throws down into the River Liffey. He meets an old flame, Mrs. Breen. He stops into the restaurant of the Burton Hotel to eat, but is sickened by the piggish manners of the patrons and leaves for Davy Burns pub, where he has a large glass of burgundy and a cheese sandwich. Davy Burns, here, is still a huge part of the Bloomsday pilgrimage in Dublin. And they still do a fine glass of burgundy. Hmm. And you can order a second one. Barman, can you top me up? I know, yeah, well, I'll be finished it soon. Wine. Soaked and softened rolled pith of bread mustard a moment mawkish cheese. Nice wine it is. Taste it better because I'm not thirsty. Bath, of course, does that. Just a bite or two. Then about six o'clock I can... Six, six. Time will be gone then. She. Mild fire of wine kindled his veins. Oh, I wanted that badly. Felt so off colour. His eyes unhungrily saw shelves of tin, sardines, gaudy lobsters, claws. All the odd things people pick up for food. Out of shells, periwinkles with a pin, off trees, snails out of the ground the French eat, out of the sea with bait on a hook. City fish, learn nothing in a thousand years. Wouldn't mind being a waiter in a swell hotel. Tips, evening dress, half-naked ladies. May I tempt you to a little more filleted lemon sole, Miss Dooby Dad? Yes, be dad. And she did be dad. Huguenot name, I expect that. And Miss Dooby Dad lived in Kalini, I remember. Du de la French. Still, it's the same fish perhaps old Mickey Hamlin of Moore Street ripped the guts out of making money, hand over fist, finger in fish's gills. Can't write his name on a cheque. Think he was painting the landscape with his mouth twisted. Mooy killing a hedge a ha. Ignorant as a kish of rogues. Worth fifty thousand pounds. 
Stuck on the pane, two flies buzzed, stuck. Glowing wine on his palate lingered, swallowed, crushing in the wine press grapes of burgundy. Sun's heat, it is. Seems to a secret touch telling me memory. Touched, his sense moistened, remembered. Hidden under wild ferns on hoth, Below us, bay, sleeping sky. No sound, sky. The bay purple by the lion's head, Green by drumleck, yellow-green towards Sutton. Fields of undersea, the lion's faint brown in grass, Buried cities. Pillowed on my coat she had her hair, Earwigs in the heather scrubbed my hand under her nape. You'll toss me all, oh wonder. Cool soft with ointments her hand touched me, caressed. Her eyes upon me did not turn away. Ravished over her I lay, full lips, full open, kissed her mouth. Young. Softly she gave me in my mouth the seed cake, warm and chewed. Mawkish pulp her mouth had mumbled, sweet and sour with spittle. Joy. I ate it. Joy. Young life, her lips that gave me pouting. Soft, warm, sticky, gum jelly lips. Flowers her eyes were, take me willing eyes. Pebbles fell, she lay still. A goat, no one. High on Ben Hoth rhododendrons a nanny goat walking sure-footed dropping currents. Screened under ferns she laughed warm folded. Wildly I lay on her, kissed her. Eyes, her lips, her stretched neck beating. Woman's breasts full in her blouse of nuns veiling. Fat nipples upright. Hot, I tongued her. She kissed me. I was kissed. All yielding, she tossed my hair. Kissed. She kissed me. Me. And me now. Stuck, the flies buzzed. Two young fellas were talking about their girls, girls, girls. Sweethearts for whom they pined, sweethearts they'd left behind. One said, mine is a shy little lass with a way so trim and small. Her eyes are grey so bright and best, best of all. My girl's a Yorkshire girl, Yorkshire through and through. My girl's a Yorkshire girl, hey, by dumb, she's a champion though. She's a factory lass and wears no fancy clothes. I've a sort of a Yorkshire relish for my little Yorkshire rose. When the first finished singing the praise of Rose, 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 or number two looked vexed, saying in tones perplexed, My lass works in a factory too, and her eyes are all so grey. Her name is Rose as well, and strange. Strange to say My girl's a Yorkshire girl Yorkshire through and through My girl's a Yorkshire girl hey, By gum she's a champion though She's a factory 
victory last and wears no fancy clothes. I've a sort of a Yorkshire relish for my little Yorkshire robes. To a cottage in Yorkshire they eyed to rose, 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 meaning to make it clear. Who is the boy most dear? Rose, Rose didn't answer the bell, but her husband did instead. Loudly he sang at them as off, off they fled. My girl's a Yorkshire girl, Yorkshire through and Girl's a Yorkshire girl, play boy gum. She's a champion dog. She's a factory lass and wears no fancy clothes. I'm a sort of a Yorkshire relish for my little Yorkshire rose. Wow, here we are in the spectacular National Library, where after several chapters with Bloom, it is time to return to the intellectual density of Stephen Dedalus. Here in the reading room, Stephen is waxing lyrical with Buck Mulligan and members of Dublin's literary elite about his theories on Hamlet and Shakespeare's life and inspirations. Shh, everybody, Kieran is an ish. What's in the name? That's what we ask ourselves in childhood when we write the name that we are told is ours. A star, a day star, a fire drake rose at his birth. It shone by day in the heavens alone, brighter than Venus in the night. And by night, it shone over Delta in Cassiopeia, the recumbent constellation, which is the signature of his initial among the stars. His eyes watched it low-lying on the horizon, eastward of the bear, as he walked by the slumberous summer fields at midnight returning from her arms. Read the skies. Where's your configuration? Stephen, Stephen, cut the bread even. Was it a celestial phenomenon? A star by night? A pillar of the cloud by day? What's more to speak? Stephen looked on his hat, his stick, his boots. Stephanos, my crown, my sword. His boots are spoiling the shape of my feet. Buy a pair, holding my socks, handkerchief too. Your own name is strange enough. I suppose it explains your fantastical humour. Fabulous artificer, the hawk-like man. You flew. Where to? Left wing. Icarus. Sea bedabbled, fallen, weltering. Lapwing you are. Lapwing be. Lapwing. I'm tired of my voice. The voice of Esau. My kingdom for a drink. On. Wandering Rocks is often compared to a game of chess, with its characters moving around the chessboard of Dublin. It brings us with Father Conmey to Jesuit House, to Gardner Street, to Marino. Blazes Boylan is in Tornton's shop, hmm, buying a gift for another woman. Bloom is in Merchant's Arch, buying a racy novel, Sweets of Sin, for Molly and a whole host of characters move around Dublin from Bachelor's Walk to Dublin Castle to the Phoenix Park and right out to the RDS showgrounds in Ballsbridge. The blonde girl in Thornton's bedded the wicker basket with rustling fibre. Blazes Boylan handed her the bottle swathed in pink tissue paper and a small jar. Put these in first, will you? He said. Yes, sir the blonde girl said, 
and the fruit on top. Oh, that'll do. Game ball, Blaze's boiling said. She bestowed fat pears neatly, head by tail, and among them ripe, shame-faced peaches. Blazes Boylan walked here and there in new tan shoes about the fruit-smelling shop, lifting fruits, young, juicy, crinkled and plump red tomatoes, sniffing smells. H-E-L-Y's filed before him, tall, white-hatted, past Tangier Lane, plodding towards their goal. He turned suddenly from a chip of strawberries, drew a gold watch from his fob and held it at its chain's length. Can you send them by tram now? A dark-backed figure under Merchant's Arch scanned books on the hawker's car. Certainly, sir. Is it in the city? Oh, yes, Blazes Boylan said. Ten minutes. The blonde girl handed him a docket and pencil. Will you write the address, sir? Blazes Boylan at the counter wrote and pushed the docket to her. Send it at once, will you? He said, it's for a, an invalid. Yes, sir, I will, sir. Blazes Boylan rattled merry money in his trousers pocket. Uh, what's the damage, he asked. The blonde girl's slim fingers reckoned the fruits. Blazes Boylan looked into the cut of her blouse, a young pullet. He took a red carnation from the tall stem glass. This for me? he asked gallantly. The blonde girl glanced sideways at him, got up regardless with his tie a bit crooked, blushing. Yes, sir, she said. Bending archly, she reckoned again, fat pears and blushing peaches. Blazes Boylan looked in her blouse with more favour, the stalk of the red flower between his smiling teeth. May I say a word to your telephone, Missy? he asked roguishly. The Song of the Siren Barmaids lures many of the characters in Ulysses to the Ormond Hotel for an afternoon of sing-song. Oh, wept, aren't men frightful idiots? Miss Douse laughs. It's nearly 4 p.m., the time that Blazes Boylan is due to have his rendezvous with Molly Bloom back in Eccles Street. Bloom can't believe it, but for the third time that day, he catches a glimpse of his love rival. He eyed and saw afar on Essex Bridge, a gay hat riding on a jaunting car. It is, again, third time. Coincidence? Jingling on supple rubbers, it jaunted from the bridge to Ormond Quay. Follow, risk it. Go quick, at four, near, now, out. Bronze by gold miss deuce's head by miss kennedy's head over the cross blind of the ormond bar heard the vice regal hoofs go by ringing steel is that her asked miss kennedy miss deuce said yeah sitting with his ex oh pearl gray and old Neil. Exquisite contrast, Miss Kennedy said when all agog, Miss Deuce said eagerly, look at the fella in the tall silk. Who, where, Gold asked more eagerly. In the second carriage, Miss Deuce's wet lips said, laughing in the sun, he's looking, mine till I see. She darted, bronze to the backmost corner, flattening her face against the pane in a halo of hurried breath, her wet lips tittered. <laughs> He's cute looking back, she laughed. Oh, wept. <laughs> Aren't men frightful Egypts? With sadness, Miss Kennedy sauntered sadly from bright light twining a loose hair behind an ear, sauntering sadly Gold no more, she twisted, twined a hair. Sadly, she twined and sauntering gold hair behind a curving ear. It's them have the fine times. Sadly, then she said, a man 
blue, who went by Moulin's pipes, bearing in his breast the sweets of sin, by wine's antiques in memory, bearing sweet, sinful words, by Carol's dusky battered plate for row. The boots to them, them in the bar, them barmaids came for them. Unheeding him, he banged on the counter his tray of chattering china and dares your teas, he said. Miss Kennedy, with manners, transposed the tea tray down to an upturned lithia crate, safe from eyes, low. What is it? Loud boots unmannerly asked. Find out, Miss Deuce retorted, leaving her spying point. <laughs> Your bow, is it? A haughty bronze replied. I'll complain to Mrs. Damasi on you if I hear any more of your impertinent insolence. <laughs> impertinent insolence, Boots snout sniffed rudely as he retreated, as she threatened, as he had come. Bloom. On her flower, frowning, Miss Deuce said, most aggravating that young brat is. If he doesn't conduct himself, I'll wring his ear for him a yard long. Ladylike, in exquisite contrast, take no notice, Miss Kennedy rejoined. She poured in a teacup tea, then back in the teapot tea. They cowered under their reef of counter, waiting on footstools, crates upturned, waiting for their teas to draw. They poured their blouses, both of black satin, to a nine a yard, waiting for their teas to draw and Two and seven. I was pure mouldy for the want of that pint. Here's me chaser. Declare to God I could hear it hit the pit of my stomach with a click. Get ready for a bust up at Barney's. More pints and pub gossip in Barney Kiernan's pub in Little Britain Street. Bloom must confront the mammoth cyclops figure of the citizen. Described as a broad-shouldered, deep-chested, strong-limbed, frank-eyed, red-haired, freely freckled, shaggy-bearded, wide-mouthed, large-nosed, long-headed, deep-voiced, bare-kneed, brawny-handed, hairy-legged, <laughs> ruddy-faced, shinnowy-armed hero. <laughs> Just watch out for the flying biscuit tins. Will you try another citizen? Says Joe. Yes, sir, says he. I will. You? Says Joe. Be holding to you, Joe, says I. May your shadow never grow less. Repeat that dose, says Joe. Bloom was talking and talking with John Wise, and he quite excited with his dunduckety mud coloured mug in him, and his old plum eyes rolling about. Persecution, says he. All the history of the world is full of it, perpetuating national hatred among nations. But do you know what a nation means? Says John Wise. Yes, says Bloom. What is it? Says John Wise. A nation, says Bloom. A nation is the same people living in the same place. By God, then, says Ned, laughing. If that's so, I'm a nation, for I'm living in the same place the past five years. So, of course, everyone had a laugh at Bloom, and says he, trying to muck out of it, or also living in different places. That covers my case, says Joe. What is your nation, if I may ask, says the citizen. Ireland, says Bloom. I was born here, Ireland. The citizen said nothing, only cleared the spit out of his gullet, and gob, he spat a red bank oyster out of him right in the corner. After you with the push, Joe, says he, taking out his handkerchief to swab himself dry. Here you are, citizen, says Joe. Take that in your right hand and repeat after me the following words. And I belong to a race too, says Bloom, that is hated and persecuted. Also now, at this very moment, this very instant. Gob, he near burnt his fingers at the butt of his old cigar. Robbed, says he, plundered, insulted, persecuted, taking what belongs to us by right. At this very moment, says he, putting up his fist. Sold by auction off in Morocco, like slaves or cattle. Are you talking about the new Jerusalem, says the citizen. I'm talking about injustice, says Bloom. Right, says John Wise, stand up to it then, with force, like men. There's an almanac picture for you, marked for a soft-nosed bullet. Old lardy face, standing up to the business end of a gun. Gup, he'd adorn a sweeping brush, so he would, if only he had a nurse's apron on him. And then he collapses all of a sudden, twisting around all the opposite, 
as limp as a wet rag. But it's no use, says he. Force, hatred, history, all that. That's not life for men and women. Insult and hatred. And everybody knows that it's the very opposite of that, that is really life. What? says Alf. Love, says Blim. I mean, the opposite of hatred. I must go now, says he to John Wise. Just round to the court a second, to see if Martin is there. If he comes back, just say I'll be back in a second. Just a moment. Who's hindering you? And off he pops, like greased lightning. A new apostle to the Gentiles, says the citizen. Universal love. Well, says John Wise, isn't that what we're told? Love your neighbour? That chap, says the citizen. Beggar my neighbour, is his motto. Love, Moya. He's a nice pattern of a Romeo and Juliet. The summer evening had begun to fold the world in its mysterious embrace. Far away in the west, the sun was setting and the last glow of all too fleeting a day lingered lovingly on sea and strand. Bloom finds his way to Sandy Mount Strand, echoing Stephen's footsteps earlier in the day. A group of girlfriends are minding children playing on the beach. Gertie McDowell, as fair a specimen of winsome Irish girlhood as one could wish to see, notices that Bloom is watching her. He was eyeing her as a snake eyes his prey. Her woman's instinct told her that she had raised the devil in him. Oh Lordy, it can only lead to fireworks. The summer evening had begun to fold the world in its mysterious embrace. Far away in the west, the sun was setting, and the last glow of all too fleeting day lingered lovingly on sea and strand, on the proud promontory of dear old Hoat, guarding as ever the waters of the bay, on the weed-grown rocks along Sandy Mount shore, and last but not least, on the quiet church, whence there streamed forth at times upon the stillness, the voice of prayer to her who is in her pure radiance, a beacon ever to the storm-tossed heart of man, Mary, star of the sea. Queen of angels, Queen of patriots, Queen of prophets of all saints, they pray, Queen of most holy rosary. And then Father Conroy handed the thurible to Canon O'Hanlon, and he put in the incense and sensed the blessed sacrament. And Sissy Caffrey caught the two twins, and she was itching to give them a ring and good clip on the ear. But she didn't, because she thought he might be watching her. But she never made a bigger mistake in all her life, because Gertie could see without looking up that he never took his eyes off of her. And then Canon O'Hanlon handed the Thurible back to Father Conroy and knelt down looking up at the Blessed Sacrament. And the choir began to sing Tantum Ergo, and she just swung her foot in and out in time as the music rose and fell to the Tantum of Gold Sacramentum. Three eleven, she paid for them stockings in Sparrows or George Street on the Tuesday, nor was it the Monday before Easter, and there wasn't a brack on them, and that was what he was looking at transparent, and not at her insignificant ones that had neither shape nor form, the cheek of her, because he had eyes in his head to see the difference for himself. And Jackie Caffrey shouted, Look, there was another, and she leaned back and the garters were blue to match on account of the transparent, and they all saw it and shouted, Look, look, there it was! And she leaned back ever so far to see the fireworks, and something queer was flying about through the air, a soft thing to and fro dark, and she saw a long Roman candle going up over the trees, up, Oh, and in the tense hush, they were all breathless with excitement as they went higher and higher, and she had to lean back more and more to look up after it, high, high, almost out of sight, and her face was suffused with a divine, with an entrancing blush from straining back. She would cry, fain have cried to him chokingly, held out her snowy slender arms to him to come, to feel his lips laid on her white brow, the cry of a young girl's love, a little strangled cry wrung from her, that cry that has rung through the ages. And then a rocket sprang and bang, shot blinded. Oh, then the Roman candle burst and was like a sigh of, oh, and then everyone cried, oh, oh, in raptures, and it gushed out of it a stream of rain-gold hair threads, and they shed, 
And ah, oh, they were all greeny, dewy stars falling with golden, oh, so lively, oh, so soft, sweet, soft. Market looking very charming, you are sure to meet those girls, dear girls, those lovely seaside girls. With sticks they steer and promenade the pier to give the boys a treat. In PK silks and lace, they tip you quite a playful wink. It really is the case. You never stop to think. You fall in love, of course, upon the spot, but not with one girl, always with a lot. Those girls, those girls, those lovely sunshine girls, will dip and smile and curls. Your head it simply whirls. They look all right. Complexions pink and white. They've diamond rings and dainty feet. Golden hair from Regent Street. Lace and grace and lots of face. Those pretty little seaside girls. There's Morgan, Clara, Gwendolyn, and Sarah. Where do they come from? Those girls, dear girls, those lovely seaside girls. In bloom are smart, they captivate the heart while cycling on the prom. At wheels and heels and toes, you must not look tis understood. But every Johnny knows, it does the eyesight good. The boys observe the latest thing in socks. Those girls, those girls, those lovely seaside girls, more dimple smiles and curls, your head it simply whirls, they look all right, complexions pink and white, they've diamond rings and dainty feet, golden hair from Regent Street, lace and grace and lots of face, those pretty little seaside girls. When you go to do a little boating just for fun, you take those girls, dear girls, those lovely seaside girls. They all say, we so dearly love to see their way on board. They make the wind begins to blow. Each girl remarks, how rough the day, it's lovely, don't you know? And then they sneak away. And as the yacht rolls slowly with the tide, you'll notice hanging o'er the vessel's side. Those girls, those girls, those lovely seaside girls, all dimpled smiles and curls, each head it simply swirls, they look a sight. Complexions green and white, their hats blow off and at your feet falls golden hair from Regent Street. Rouge and puffs slide down the coast of pretty little seaside girls. We are all born in the same way, but we all die in different ways. Over there, in Hollis Street Hospital, poor old Mina Purfoy is three days into a hard labour. Filled with compassion for the expectant mother, the wandering bloom arrives outside and is welcomed in to a drinking session with the student doctors. Stephen, after his long day's drinking, is the drunkest of all. This chapter is about the history of the English language, moving with Latinate prose to a literate of Anglo-Saxon to 
come on, you wine fizzling, gin sizzling, booze guzzling existences. Come on, you doggone, bull necked, beetle browed, hog jowled, peanut brained, weaselly eyed, four flushers, false alarms, and excess baggage. With a drunken Stephen, ending proceedings with a delightful drunken oration. It is a chapter best enjoyed with a glass of wine. Hmm. Mine's a burgundy. The voices blend and fuse in clouded silence. Silence that is the infinite of space and swiftly Silently, the soul is wafted over regions of cycles of generations that have lived. A region where great twilight ever descends, never falls on wide sage green pasture fields, shedding her dusk, scattering a perennial dew of stars. She follows her mother with ungainly steps, a mare leading her filly foal. Twilight phantoms are they yet molded in prophetic grace of structure, slim shapely hunches, a supple tenderness neck, the meek apprehensive skull. They fade, sad phantoms all is gone and on the highway of clouds they come, muttering thunder of rebellion, the ghosts of beasts, <laughs> hark, <laughs> parallax stalks behind and goads them. The lancinating lightnings of whose brow are scorpions, elk and yak, the bulls of Bashan and of Babylon, mammoth and mastodon, they come trooping to the sunken sea, ominous, revengeful, zodiacal host. They moan, passing upon the clouds, horned and capricorned, the trumpeted with tusk, the lion maned, the giant alard, the snoucher and crawler, rodent, ruminant and potsherderm, all their moving, moaning multitude, murderers of the sun. Has little Mousy any tickles tonight? It's 11.25 p.m. in the Monto area, north of the River Liffey, which in Joyce's day was Europe's largest red light district, known by journalists and scoundrels as Night Town. Written as a play, the chapter is a shape-shifting hallucination where we meet all the characters from the novel in many forms. Bloom and Stephen head through the Mabbott Street entrance towards the infamous Bella Cohn's brothel and into a wild space where anything can happen and does. The soldiers and whores dance and ghosts appear. In this world, gramophones and lawnmowers can speak and the end of the world sings in a Scottish accent. The door opens. Bella Cohen, a massive whore mistress, enters. She is dressed in a three-quarter ivory gown fringed around the hem with tasseled selvage, and cools herself flirting a black horn fan like a mini hawk in Carmen. On her left hand are wedding and keeper rings. Her eyes are deeply carboned. She has a sprouting moustache. Her olive face is heavy, slightly sweated and full-nosed with orange-tainted nostrils. She has lace pendant beryl eardrops. Bella. My word, I'm all of a muck sweat. She glances around her at the couples, then her eyes rest on Bloom with hard insistence. Her lace fan winnows wind towards her heated face, neck, and embonpoint. Her falcon eyes glitter. The fan, flirting quickly, then slowly. Married, I see. Bloom. Yes, partly. I have mislaid. The fan, half opening, then closing. And the missus is master. Petticoat government. Bloom looks down with a sheepish grin. That is so. The fan, folding together, rests against her eardrop. Have you forgotten me? Bloom. Yes. No. The fan, folded akimbo against her waist. Is me her was you dreamed before? Was then she him you us since knew? 
Am all them and the same now we? Bella approaches, gently tapping with the fan. Bloom, wincing. Powerful being, in my eyes read that slumber which women love. The fan, tapping. We have met. You are mine. It is fate. Bloom, cowed. Exuberant female, enormously I desiderate your domination. I am exhausted, abandoned, no longer young. I stand, so to speak, with an unposted letter bearing the extra regulation fee before the too late box of the general post office of human life. The door and window open at a right angle cause a draft of thirty-two feet per second, according to the law of falling bodies. I have felt this instant a twinge of sciatica in my left gluteal muscle. It runs in our family. Poor dear papa, a widower, was a regular barometer from it. He believed in animal heat. A skin of tabby lined his winter waistcoat. Near the end, remembering King David and the Sunamite, he shared his bed with Athos, faithful after death. A dog's spittle, as you probably... He winces. Ah! In a long-gone cabman's shelter under Buck Bridge by the Customs House, a very sober Bloom, on his way home, decides that a very drunk Stephen needs a late-night coffee in an effort to sober him up. They stop, the coffee is cold and stale, and the conversation isn't much better. They are forced to listen to a tough old sailor, W.B. Murphy, and the other, Near Do Wells. En route to his taciturn, and not to put too fine a point on it, not yet perfectly sober companion, Mr. Bloom, who at all events was in complete possession of his faculties, never more so, in fact disgustingly sober, spoke a word of caution with the dangers of night town. Women of ill fame and swell mobsmen, which barely permissible once in a while, though not as a habitual practice, was of the nature of a regular death trap for young fellows of his age particularly if they had acquired drinking habits under the influence of liquor. Unless you knew a little jujitsu for every contingency, as even a fellow on the broad of his back could administer a nasty kick if you didn't look out. Highly providential was the appearance on the scene of Corny Kelleher, when Stephen was blissfully unconscious that, but for that man in the gap turning up at the 11th hour, the finis might have been that he might have been a candidate for the accident ward, or, failing that, the bride well, and an appearance in the court next day before Mr. Tobias, or he being the solicitor rather old wall, he meant to say, or Maloney, which simply spelt ruin for a chap when it got bruited about. The reason he mentioned the fact was that a lot of those policemen, whom he cordially disliked, were admittedly unscrupulous in the service of the Crown, and, as Mr. Bloom put it, recalling a case or two in the A Division in Clambrassel Street, prepared to swear a hole through a ten-gallon pot. Never on the spot when wanted, but in quiet parts of the city, Pembroke Road, for example, the guardians of the law were well in evidence, the obvious reason being they were paid to protect the upper classes. Another thing he commented on was equipping soldiers with firearms or sidearms of any description, liable to go off at any time, which was tantamount to inciting them against civilians, should by any chance they fall out over anything. You frittered away your time, he very sensibly maintained, and health, and also character, besides which the squandermania of the thing. Fast women of the demi-monde ran away, with a lot of pounds, shillings and pence into the bargain. And the greatest danger of all was who you got drunk with. Though, touching the much vexed question of stimulants, he relished a glass of choice old wine in season as both nourishing and blood-making, and possessing aperient virtues, notably a good burgundy, which he was a staunch believer in. Still, never beyond a certain point where he invariably drew the line as it simply led to trouble all round. To say nothing of your being at the tender mercy of others practically. Most of all, he commented adversely on the desertion of Stephen by all his pub-hunting confreres but one, 
a most glaring piece of ratting on the part of his brother Medicos under all the circs. And that one was Judas, said Stephen, who up to then had said nothing whatsoever of any kind. Discussing these and kindred topics, they made a beeline across the back of the custom house and passed under the loop line bridge when a brazier of coke burning in front of a sentry box or something like one attracted their rather lagging footsteps. Stephen of his own accord stopped for no special reason to look at the heap of barren cobblestones and by the light emanating from the brazier, he could just make out the darker figure of the corporation watchman inside the gloom of the sentry box. He began to remember that this had happened or had been mentioned as having happened before, but it cost him no small effort before he remembered that he recognized in the sentry a quondam friend of his father's, Gumley. To avoid a meeting, he drew nearer to the pillars of the railway bridge. Under the heaven tree of stars, Bloom and Stephen make it back to 7 Eccle Street, a real life house that Joyce has visited his friend John Francis Byrne in. Though the house no longer exists, the door was saved and lives in the backyard here in the Joyce Centre. Ithaca is written as a series of questions and answers as Bloom ponders his life's biggest concepts. Literally, the sun, the moon, and the stars. It is 1 a.m. Bloom forgets his keys and has snuck into his house. Try not to wake the sleeping Molly. They drink cocoa before Stephen has sobered up enough to leave and head off into the Dublin night. Bloom finally lies down in bed, head to tail with Molly, gives her a cheeky little kiss on the bum, and rests. Here's Bloom's logical conclusion, having weighed the matter and allowing for possible error, that it was not a heaven tree, not a heaven grot, not a heaven beast, not a heaven man, that it was a utopia, there being no known method from the known to the unknown, an infinity renderable equally finite by the supposition's probable apposition of one or more bodies equally of the same and of different magnitudes. A mobility of illusory forms immobilized in space, remobilized in air. A past which possibly had ceased to exist as a present before its future spectators had entered actual present existence. Was he more convinced of the aesthetic value of the spectacle? Indubitably, in consequence of the reiterated examples of poets in the delirium of the frenzy of attachment or in the abasement of rejection invoking ardent sympathetic constellations or the frigidity of the satellite of their planet. Did he then accept as an article of belief the theory of astrological influences upon sublunary disasters? It seemed to him as possible of proof as of confutation and the nomenclature employed in its stenographical charts as attributable to verifiable intuition as to fallacious analogy. The Lake of Dreams the sea of rains, the gulf of Jews, the ocean of fecundity. What special affinities appeared to him to exist between the moon and woman? Her antiquity in preceding and surviving successive Tellurian generations. Her nocturnal predominance. Her satellitic dependence. Her luminary reflection, her constancy under all her phases, rising and setting by her appointed times, waxing and waning. The forced invariability of her aspect, her indeterminate response to inaffirmative interrogation, 
or potency over effluent and refluent waters, or power to enamour, to mortify, to invest with beauty, to render insane, to incite to and aid delinquency. The tranquil inscrutability of a visage, the terribility of her isolated, dominant, implacable, resplendent propinquity, her omens of tempest and of calm, the stimulation of her light, her motion and her presence, the admonition of her craters, her arid seas, her silence, her splendour when visible, her attraction when invisible. What visible luminous sign attracted blooms who attracted Stephen's gaze? In the second story rear of his Bloom's house, the light of a paraffin oil lamp with oblique shade projected on a screen of roller blind, supplied by Frank O'Hara, window blind, curtain pole, and revolving shutter manufacturer, 16 Angel Street. And finally, we heard the voice of Molly Bloom in one of the most famous soliloquies in all of literature. Joyce called this chapter Penelope, after the wife of Ulysses, who waited patiently for him as he travelled. Joyce's own wife, Nora, stated, that man knows nothing about women. <laughs> and as the archetype for Molly Bloom, many of her musings are said to come straight from Nora. It's 2 a.m. in 7 Eccles Street and Molly is in bed. Molly's sleepy, dreamlike monologue is made up of eight very long sentences with little or no punctuation. Her thoughts meander like Bloom's did as he wandered through the streets of Dublin, thrilling the reader with her passionate pronouncements on life and love and everything in between. From thoughts on blazes boiling, to fantasies, to dreaming up filthy words, to how lovable Bloom was as she recalls the day he proposed to her on Hoth Head. Yes. I love flowers. I'd love to have the whole place swimming in roses. God of heaven, there is nothing like nature. The wild mountains and the sea and the waves rushing and the beautiful country with a field of oats and wheat and all kinds of things. And all the fine cattle going about. It would do your heart good to see rivers and lakes and flowers all sorts of shapes and smells and colours springing up, even out of the ditches. Primroses and violets. Nature it is. As for them saying there's no God, I wouldn't give a snap of my two fingers for all their learning. Why don't they go and create something, I often asked him. Atheists, or whatever they call themselves, go and wash the cobbles of themselves first, then they can go howling for the priest and they dying, and why? Why? Because they're afraid of hell on account of their bad conscience. Ah, yes. I know them well. Who was the first person in the universe before there was anybody that made it at all? Who? Ah. That they don't know. <laughs> Neither do I. So there you are. They might as well try to stop the sun from rising tomorrow. The sun shines for you, he said that day. You were lying among the rhododendrons on Hoth Head, in a grey tweed suit and his straw hat. 
the day I got him to propose to me, yes. First I gave him the bit of seed cake out of my mouth and it was leap year, like now, yes. Sixteen years ago. My God. After that long kiss, I near lost my breath. Yes, he said, I was a flower of the mountain. Yes, so we are flowers, all a woman's body. Yes. That was the one true thing he said in all his life. And the sun shines for you today. <laughs> yes. That's why I liked him, because I saw he understood or felt what a woman is and I knew I could always get around him. And I gave him all the pleasure I could, leading him on till he asked me to say yes. And I wouldn't answer at first, only looked out over the sea and the sky. I was thinking of so many things he didn't know of. Mulvey and Mr. Stanhope and Hester and father and old Captain Groves, and the sailors playing all birds fly, and I say, stoop, and washing up dishes, they called it on the pier, and the sentry in front of the governor's house with the thing around his white helmet, poor devil, half roasted, <laughs> the Spanish girls laughing in their shawls and their tall combs, and the auctions in the morning, the Greeks and the Jews and the Arabs, and devil knows who else from all ends of Europe, and Duke Street, and the foul market all clucking outside, larby sharons. <laughs> and the poor donkeys, slipping half asleep. And the vague fellows in the cloaks asleep in the shade on the steps. And the big wheels of the carts of the bulls. And the old castle, thousands of years old, yes. Oh, and those handsome moors all in white and turbans like kings asking you to sit down in their little bit of a shop and ronda with the old windows of the posadas. Two little glancing eyes, a lattice hid for her lover to kiss the iron and the wine shops half open at night and the castanets and the night we missed the boat at Algiers. <laughs> the watchman going about serene with his lamp Oh, oh, and that awful deep downturn. Oh, and the sea, the sea crimson, sometimes like fire, and the glorious sunsets and the fig trees in the Almedia gardens, yes, and all the queer little streets and the pink and blue and yellow houses and the rose gardens and the jessamine and the geraniums and the cactuses and Gibraltar. As a girl where I was the flower of the mountain. Yes. <laughs> when I put the rose in my hair like the Andalusian girls use. Or shall I wear red? Yes. <laughs> and how he kissed me under the Moorish wall. And I thought, well, as well as him as another. And then I asked him with my eyes to ask again. Yes. And then he asked me, would I? Yes. 
to say, yes, my mountain flower. And I first I put my arms around him, yes, and drew him down to me so he could feel my breast all perfume, yes. And his heart was going like mad and yes, I said yes. I will. Yes. Thank you for taking this trip through Dublin and Ulysses with us. We hope we have inspired you to read or reread Joyce's famous words from his snot green sea to Molly Bloom's famous yes, and to visit the locations in Dublin that were his inspiration. We hope to see you next year for Ulysses 100th anniversary. Once in the dear, dead days beyond recall When on the world the mists began to fall Out of the dreams that rose in happy throng Love to our hearts, love sung an old sweet song And in the dusk where fell the fire gleam softly it wove itself into a dream just a song at twilight when the lights are low and the flickering shadows softly come and go I'd be weary, said the day yet long. Still to us at twilight comes love's old song, comes love's old sweet. dwells forevermore footsteps may falter weary grow the way still we can hear it at the close of day so till the end when life's dim shadows fall love will be found the sweetest song of Just a song at twilight When the lights are low And the flickering shadows Softly come and go Though the heart be weary